uh, on the laptop? Okay. We'll find out in a minute. I just want to let you know I made it here. Mom was right. It took forever to find, but it's perfect. What did you say the name of this place was? Is this paradise? Thirty, forty yards. It takes them thirty-two seconds. wants to go in the water. That makes me want to go in the water. Uh, when I was a little kid, I, uh, I wanted to be a marine biologist in part because I saw Jaws. So different people have different risk tolerance. Uh, let's see. Okay. So let's get to our topic of the day. Reunions are strange. They bring up a lot of feelings about your past. Me, uh, Who did you there we go. Okay. So someone asked me earlier today if I was a hacker. And clearly, I'm not a hacker because I'm not wearing a hoodie. <clears throat> Does anybody in here identify as a hacker? There's got to be hackers in Germany. All right, a couple of you, good. So what I really want to talk about is um, a term I'm using, cyber safety. Because when we think of cyber security, we tend to think of confidentiality or something that has highly tolerable, recoverable losses. And when we think of safety, we think, We've got it covered. You know, we do really good engineering. We do. We validate the intended use of things. But what you have now found is that all these traditional manufacturing industries that are really good at physical safety, because the laws of physics don't change every day, they believe that they have a handle on safety when it comes to cyber physical systems. So um, when you look at the Internet of Things, I'm less concerned about my privacy. And of course, here in Germany, privacy is even more important than elsewhere. Uh, well, we make a joke that we love our privacy, but we'd like to be alive to enjoy it. So one of the reasons I showed you the shark talk, uh, the shark uh, trailer, which I'm very excited for, is um, one way I've tried to explain this issue to why I'm concerned about the Internet of Things is through a, a shark metaphor. So I'm going to give you a very brief look at how we talk to the outside world about safety in the Internet of Things. And we're going to liken it to swimming with sharks. 
Then I'm going to show you a, a, a specific chunk on techniques we've been using to specifically with the automotive industry, but you can see the framework that we've created will be very useful to any type of IoT, cyber safety, as you design these things, um, develop these things, implement these things, and deploy these things. And then lastly, because this is mostly developer conference, I'll give a few more specific tidbits that may be directly useful um, to the development community. So as I said before, I love sharks. Um, I've gone scuba diving for as long as I could. And typically, when you're diving, sharks don't like people very much. They just want to stay away from you, um, unless there's blood in the water or they're, or they're hungry. So often, far in the distance, I could see a shark, maybe a small shark, and then they would go away. Uh, so when I had the chance, when a friend of mine, Dave Litchfield, is a world-class hacker, he mostly is the apex predator that goes after Oracle and Microsoft before that, he goes on shark dives all the time. And it turned out this one time about three years ago, I was able to go with him. So one of my dreams is to actually see hammerheads in the wild. It's one of the most beautiful things because they, they actually are the only kind of shark that swims in a school. Uh, and it's just absolutely stunning. Now, you could go swimming every single day of your life in the ocean and never see a shark. You don't necessarily want or have to encounter them. They mostly keep to themselves. But as soon as a little bit of blood is in the water, they'll come very, very quickly. So ironically, if you don't want to see them, you, you probably don't want to drop some blood in the water. But when Dave and I did this shark dive off the coast of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, uh, we didn't know what kind of sharks we would see. But within about two minutes of putting the blood in the water, uh, this little guy showed up. This is a blue shark. It's a pretty good size. Initially, it was curious. Then it was very aggressive. Then it started getting, uh, it was proving to me that uh, we didn't really belong there. This was their domain. This is an apex predator. It's the top of the food chain. In fact, when we had tried to get our friends to come with us, everyone made polite excuses because it's a very expensive thing to do. So we wanted more people to help split the cost. My boss at the time, he was more blunt. He said, what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? But again, I really wanted to see these things up close. They're, they're one of nature's perfect creatures. They've been killing for you know, thousands and thousands of years. Now, if you think I'm stupid to get in the water in the cage, just remember that Dave took the picture. <coughs> um, this is not his riskiest moment either. Now, in the cybersecurity realm, which I know some of you from last night are, have a tremendous experience in, we have this old cliche that makes us feel better. It doesn't actually make us safer, but it makes us feel better. We say that you don't have to swim faster than the shark. You just have to swim faster than your friend. <clears throat> One of the things, though, we're forgetting is that the sharks also have friends. And this photo was taken just after the photo of me in the cage, because as he turned around, there were two right behind him. In fact, the following photo isn't come out very well, but it's the inside of one of their mouths because they, they were biting the camera. So what was one became three, became five. And even though I was in the safety of the cage, it was impossible for me to look 360 degrees around me and my arms and legs were bouncing out. And at some point, I started to get scared and I remembered what my boss had said to me. Once again, what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? And I truly didn't feel safe anymore. So as much as I love sharks and I'm dying to go see that movie, you know, the, the primal survival instinct kicks in. In fact, not only did I not feel safe in the water, when I got back in the boat, I didn't feel safe at all. And we were still three hours from shore. And it's not like I was likely to fall out, but this was the apex predator of this domain. And we had no business being there. Now, this is a photo he took on a previous dive, and I think it ultimately made it into uh, National Geographic. So he has a much, much higher risk tolerance than I do. Now, when we, while you know, I'm not a hacker, but I study hackers, and I, um, I try to hone my expertise not on what did they do or how did they do it, but why did they do it. So I study the various species of hackers, their motivations. And when there's new types of sharks on, on, the, on the scene, I want to know, how are they motivated, what prey will they go after, and what's their dynamic range of capabilities. So when we got back into the boat and we had the three-hour uh, ride back, we had to talk about how hard cybersecurity is becoming. So just like my friends thought I was an idiot to get in the water with an apex predator, they also thought I was an idiot to study these guys. Hopefully, at this point, everyone recognizes this image. Okay, so this is some artwork we had done when we studied Anonymous. I spent a few years 
researching them before anyone understood what was going on. And I saw this as culturally significant. So we called it Building a Better Anonymous. And we wrote about it over the course of about a year and a half in an open dialogue with the movement. And of all the different insights that we gleaned, some of the most important ones were that it, despite having very, very few hackers and very, very few talented hackers, they were wildly successful at taking down most of their targets. If you remember LulzSec, a particularly aggressive subgroup within Anonymous, they did a 50-day summer of lulls where they went after dozens of organizations with impunity and successfully took down every single target. And while their methods were not hard to defend against, no one was prepared for this new species of apex predator. And uh, as such, they kind of revealed to the entire world that hacking power exists and is available to anyone. So it's not about this having to have a high level of skill, it's about having the will to assert your, yourself on others. Now on the other end of the spectrum, there were nation states kind of overwhelming us. And we saw that when you have the might and resources and talent of a whole country aimed at stealing your intellectual property, you're going to lose it, right? So if we can't handle the kids in Anonymous, then we certainly can't handle the resources of a nation state. And if you really think about it, whether it's organized crime stealing credit cards, every single credit card merchant that has been PCI compliant has been compromised. The failure rate is about 100%. Doesn't matter how compliant you are, it's just not working. And then conversely, every one of the Fortune 100 companies has had a loss of intellectual property or a loss of trade secrets. So there's, they're spending millions of dollars each and they're having about 100% failure rate. So guess how I feel when I think about the Internet of Things, where we're not even trying to secure these things yet. So where we try the failure rate on a long enough timeline is nearly 100%. Now, one of the reasons for this is, be, even though the security industry doesn't want to tell you this, they want to sell you cures that don't really work, just like shark repellent that doesn't really work. What the nature of cyber is that offense and attacking is really, really easy, and defending things is really, really hard. And the same is true for our enemies, but what we often forget is that the democratized West has a lot more to lose because we're a lot more dependent on some of these connected technologies. So if this is the nature, state of nature, the state of offense, then no wonder we're losing, right? So ultimately we did get back to shore and I started to feel comfortable. I kissed the ground because I was back to the safety of dry land. And then about 30 seconds after I you know, finally felt safe that I was no longer in the, the context of those apex predators, I look at my brand new car that I just got in a week prior, my hyper-connected car, my car with you know, 69 different computers in it. It's not a computer on wheels, it's a data center on wheels, right? I didn't turn the key, I pressed a button, I watched an operating system boot up. I saw it fetch music and songs from the internet over my infotainment system. And it dawned on me that the internet of things is a tsunami. Right? We're going to have connected technology permeating every aspect of our life. And in the digital realm, we also have apex predators. So for the third time that day, I heard my boss's words. What kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? Because when you add software to something, you make it hackable. And when you connect it to something else, you make it exposed. So the internet of things is an internet of hackable things. So we should be very, very careful which things we choose to put software and connectivity on. Because sometimes the consequences of failure will be measured in life and limb, in flesh and blood. So this is not my car, but this is one of those high-tech cars. This is a Toyota Prius. And I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but um, before they hacked the Jeep, uh, Chris uh, Valasek and Charlie Miller had hacked Toyota Prius and a Ford Focus, just to show how much of a current uh, modern automobile is controlled by software. And they were able to do things like turn the steering wheel, shut off the brakes, change the stereo, lie on the, on the speed and odometer. But it's, it's, it's really stunning. It's hard to find a dumb car these days. So everyone says they want to keep their older cars. But even the older ones have lots of computers in them. What's changing is that we're starting to add connectivity so that anyone in the world can manipulate your car. It's not just our cars, it's also our medical devices. One of our friends in the cavalry is a diabetic, and many of you know about Barnaby Jack, but Jay Radcliffe actually hacked his own medical insulin pump and realized it could give him a lethal dose and kill him. 
and then he went to a different manufacturer who had basically the same issue. And what he keeps trying to ask is, why the heck did anybody put Bluetooth on a device that can kill me? And they didn't, if they're going to do Bluetooth on a device that can kill him, they should at least do adversary threat modeling, they should do adversary resilience testing. The standard of care should be higher, again, when the consequences of failure involve life and limb. Now, ultimately, he couldn't find a satisfactory answer from any of them, so he's gone back to manual injections and has given up on these technologies until he feels that they are worthy of trust. It's also in the home, right? We all talk about the hackable fridges, which is nauseating to me if I, I never, ever want to hear about a hackable fridge again. I kind of don't care if my refrigerator is sending spam. Your home computer is probably sending spam. I'm much, much more concerned about the safety implications. And what's sad for me is that of all the researcher friends we know that look at Bluetooth door locks or high-tech um, home alarm systems and video systems, not one of them has stood up to scrutiny or evaluation. All of them have been compromised. Every single one that they have tried to look at has failed. So the very locks you buy to keep bad people out of your home are the very things that will let them into your home. And this includes industrial grade things for, for building automation and whatnot. So we're kind of putting software and connectivity on everything. They call it the bacon principle. Everything's better with bacon. Everything's better with Bluetooth. And we assume that if we just put it there, it'll be awesome. Um, if you don't know what Shodan is, and apparently several people last night didn't, uh, Shodan is essentially Google for hackers. But look what it says right on the front page. Uh, webcams, routers, power plants, wind turbines. Essentially, you can look for uh, industrial control systems and power plant utilities directly connected to the internet. And what's worse is a lot of these devices are manufactured in an era where we didn't think they'd ever be connected to the internet. So they have hard-coded default usernames and passwords. And if you don't know what they are, you can just Google for those as well. So you don't technically even need hacking. You need a search engine and the willpower to hurt someone. In fact, uh, this is starting to come to light that this is being used more and more. Uh, and some of the court cases are becoming public and unsealed. So if, if you want to search for ICS or PLC, like a programmable logic controller, you're going to find quite a bit. And they'll even show you where in the world it is if you wanted to you know, hit the button and do something bad. So when we were looking at all these things, and this is a little bit of the origin of the name, <clears throat> for many years I was growing much, much more concerned about the relationship between technology and the human condition on a number of fronts. And I naively believed that if I got the right message in front of the right person in the right power, part of government or whatnot, that the adults would fix it, that they would come save us, right? If only we told them what was wrong, they would fix it. And after several years of my career getting his, the permission to get as high and deep as I could in my government and the European governments, we got the right message to the right people, and they couldn't do a thing about it. And it dawned on me that the cavalry isn't coming. So at the end of the Western movies, even though most of them were made in Italy, uh, the horse-ridden soldiers come over the hill and they save the day at the last minute. And that's just not going to happen. And that recognition was very depressing for about 30 seconds. And then it was very empowering as well. Because if you know that the cavalry isn't coming, you can choose to be what's missing. Right? You can choose to be a voice of reason technical literacy, an ambassador and translator of what we know to public policymakers, the general public, and affected industries that touch life and limb. So we chose to do that. We didn't know what to do, but we were going to think like hackers, and we are going to try things. We we're going to fail fast and iterate, take a very DevOps-type approach, very lean. We were going to do what we do best and map out the chain of influence, fuzz the chain of influence, try things, and find some way to actually affect our own safety and our family's safety. So I am the cavalry isn't Josh, it's you. It's something that you would declare that from wherever you are and whatever skills you have, you would choose to be part of that solution. Now, why this matters now as opposed to in the past, cybersecurity is not a new market. But I would argue that despite the 100 Fortune 100 companies that have lost intellectual property, and despite the fact that everyone's lost a credit card or several, perhaps even this year, we haven't really had a high consequence failure from hacking yet. Because if things get bad enough, if we start to see a lot of people eaten by sharks, so to speak, we will be motivated to take a corrective action. And because we haven't done that yet, even the Ashley Madison breaches, even the big target breaches, even the fact that 
I'll show you in a minute, but some, some hospitals have been affected by ransomware accidentally. We are going to have a very high consequence failure that will scare people enough that there'll be a crisis of confidence. So not only will these consequential failures be measured in life and limb and the number of people killed or hurt, but more importantly to the governments that we're speaking to, they might find it perfectly acceptable that hackable cars get people killed because in, in 2014 alone, the US counted 32,000 deaths in vehicles. So society clearly thinks that losing 32,000 people in a year is an acceptable loss. It's not so much the specific number of people hurt by hackable vehicles, it will be the crisis of confidence and trust that people place in connected vehicles. Because if your mother-in-law is no longer willing to trust her connected vehicle, that would have a significant impact on national GDP and income. It would have a significant impact on jobs. It would have a significant impact on saving lives because the promise of a connected vehicles and semi-autonomous and autonomous vehicles is to cut down the 94% of those deaths that are caused by human error. So what we really want is the benefits of connected technology and the cost of securing those is maintaining the trust. And if we are too cavalier or too reckless in our desire to put software and connectivity on everything, we will shatter that trust and that will truly be a consequential failure. Now this is, might be hard to see and most people don't know the history as well, but this is a river on fire in the early 1900s. It was in Ohio. It was called the Cuyahoga River. And at that point in history, the, the manufacturing industry was polluting so badly that a river was able to catch on fire and stay on fire for days. This was not the first time it caught on fire. It was just the first time the press got there in time to take pictures of it. But because of that, that was the high consequence moment that led to environmental law and different pollution things. And in the United States, at least, it was the Environmental Protection Agency, much like you see now with the international approaches to climate change and whatnot. But it took a really bad failure to cause the corrective action. Now, if you fast forward past those examples I might have used during the sharks, we've now had the very first confirmed power outage due to hacking. Now, many of us have known that there's been lots of power outages due to hacking, but this was the first confirmed one in Ukraine. And that's fairly scary if you can shut down a nation's infrastructure, since most of the things we do depend on electricity. If you can shut it down for a long period of time, in the winter, in the summer, you could affect lives, you could affect response and logistics. Separately, if you remember that Shodan tool that I told you about, S-H-O-D-A-N, um, there's been recently a court case that was sealed and private, and they unsealed it. There was an Iranian hacker who successfully compromised a water facility using industrial control systems over the internet. It happened to have no water in it. It was a, an offline system, thankfully, but it's proof that people are at least experimenting with trying to affect public infrastructure. This is a hospital in Hollywood, California, and no one deliberately tried to hack it. But ha what happened is, and I know that ransomware is hitting Germany pretty badly as well with things like CryptoLocker. There is a particular one called SamSam, which is looking for one Bitcoin, or a cer certain number of Bitcoins, actually. I think it translated into about $17,000 US. It was a very small amount. But because this hospital didn't know how to pay it, and didn't pay it in time, they actually had to shut down patient care and move patients from their hospital to other hospitals. And if you have people that are seriously injured or in critical care, people could die. So this was not the intent of the malware, it was just a byproduct, it was collateral damage of the, the ransomware. In fact, had they known they were in a hospital, the ransom probably would have gone up. And since then, there have been a spate of many, many hospitals taken offline and had to pay. And those are the ones that have hit the news. Some of the researchers that I work with, we know that's actually shut down train systems, city municipalities in Chicago, different areas have been affected by the similar thing. So if this is being done by a criminal group that's not looking to hurt anyone, and now they realize they can shut down hospitals, what would an ideological adversary do? What would someone who wants to hurt people or wants to scare the public, who wants to shatter that confidence to cause that crisis so people are afraid of connected technologies? And most hospitals, if you've ever worked in one, they don't even have a security team. They might have a chief information security officer, maybe, but they can either buy a new security device or a new ambulance. They can either hire an IT security guy or a new doctor. They just, 
Every dollar they spend on security is a dollar they're not spending on patient care. So this one gives me great concern, and this might, in fact, be that Cuyahoga River on fire moment. This might be that high-consequence failure when we see hospitals incapable of delivering care, especially if combined with a physical attack. So I live near Boston, and my wife usually runs the Boston Marathon, and you might recall a few years ago there was a bombing right at the finish line. And while it was tra traumatizing and scared people, one of the reasons the death count was so low is it was only a block or two away from some of the best hospitals in the world. If you would combine something like this attack with something like that attack, it would have been significantly more terrifying to the public. And who stands between them and that the, the promise of technology or the peril of that technology? It's going to be you in this room. It's going to be the people designing and building and developing that software and that connectivity who have the judgment to know when you should put Bluetooth on something and when you should not. I love the line from yesterday's keynote that just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? So back to Anonymous, though. When I researched them, I wasn't as worried about Anonymous. In fact, I've kind of befriended many of the key personalities in the group, right? Uh, it's, it was really not a group, but a group of groups and a brand and a franchise that anyone could, could don. What I was more worried about is that this was the, 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 the first wave or an indicator or the canary in the coal mine of what was to come. And I was much more concerned about who would pick up this blueprint and perfect it and maybe have more uh, aggressive goals to use that power. In fact, we even used a blueprint symbol in the building of Better Anonymous. And I think it's undeniable if you look at the global news that ISIS has really perfected the blueprint that Anonymous pioneered. They're making much better use of social media and recruitment. They're doing a much better job staying several steps ahead of law enforcement internationally. And it's not just social media they're doing. My greatest fear has kind of come true already. If you guys don't know that symbol, that's poison and uh, team poison from uh, Anonymous. While Anonymous had actually very, very few hackers, one of the crews that did have hacking skill was team poison. And at some point after our research ended, one of the hackers in Team Poison out of the UK, uh, his handle was Trick, as we knew him, but he, his, uh, another name was Hussein, he radicalized and joined ISIS. This isn't science fiction, this is truth. And he was recruiting other hackers to help ISIS do actual attacks. So it wasn't just about tweeting, it was about rudimentary hacking skills, and while they weren't gonna have the resources of a nation state, they certainly had the ability to use Shodan and use freely available attack tools. And unlike nation states, they have the willpower to do something about it. Now, shortly after um, he was discovered and enough evidence collected, this particular hacker was killed in a drone strike. But it only takes one to do significant damage and again, cause that high consequence moment. Now, this is a little hard to see, but can anybody recognize this symbol? Does anybody know what this picture is? The BP oil spill, the deep water horizon. We know very, very little about computer science, and we know even less about computer security. But one of the things we know from all sorts of engineering is that all systems fail. So we're going to have a failure. It's not an if, it's a when. In fact, I'm shocked it hasn't happened already. The question isn't, will an oil spill happen? It's how quickly can we respond to it? How quickly can we contain and isolate it? And the, the big problem with the BP oil spill is that when it happened, it was weeks and weeks and weeks of just gushing oil, and there was nothing they could do about it. I don't remember the total dollar amount um, of that cleanup, but I think it was north of 32 billion the last time I heard. So we know a car is gonna be hacked, and it doesn't matter which car company gets hacked, it'll hurt the entire car industry. So what I've been focused less on is trying to scare people around don't have connected vehicles. We can't stop it. What I've been trying to do is encourage them to be more prepared for failure. So to that end, and I'm going to talk about this in more depth in a few minutes, but I am the cavalry who put out a five-star automotive cyber safety framework that says you must be this tall to ride the Internet of Things. You must have these five basic capacities towards failure. And I'm going to show you exactly what we showed the auto industry in a few slides. We similarly did something for the connected medical industry. We call it the Hippocratic Oath for connected medical devices. 
And these are all published, and you can read these at your leisure. In fact, I found out, I don't know if it's ready enough for today, but one of the first uh, translations we're doing of the Five Star is for German, given the, the proud tradition of uh, auto manufacturers you have. So in the context of this, we have a long way to go. We're about three years into this experiment. We launched at DEF CON uh, in August, uh, three years ago. Um, and we, we don't have all the answers, but we're trying. And we're having far greater successes. In fact, if I have time during the q and I will tell you one particularly strong uh, success that we've had. But we have to try, and we have to figure this out, because sharks patrol these waters. They are around us. And whether we like it or not, whether we thought about it or not, when we put software and connectivity in everything, we are adrift in the Internet of Things. And unfortunately, blood is in the water. So you have a role to play. So here's a, an overview of that five-star cyber safety framework that I gave to the automotive industry. So these are, this is Chris and Charlie when they hacked the Toyota Prius. Um, I tried to play unsafe at any speed. Uh, that was a couple years ago. They're probably more famous for the video you saw earlier, which was last summer they hacked the Jeep without touching it. At least the other hacks, they had to physically touch the vehicles first. Um, back to the all systems fail. Since there's a lot of programmers in here, you'll get this. Oh, well, is anybody actually, oh, I'll still ask this, hopefully at this point. Does anybody think a car won't be hacked? Do you think I'm just being a fear monger? All right, it's going to happen. It's already happened, but it's going to happen publicly. So one of the things I teach my students at Carnegie Mellon University is uh, when you look at software, we know there's a certain defect rate per thousand lines of code. We measure it by thousand lines of code, not millions. There's a defect rate for every thousand lines of code, and it's unavoidable. In fact, it's not even economic to eliminate that down to zero. No one does it. So if there's a certain defect rate per thousand lines of code, and it only takes one of those defects to cause a bad day, what happens when you're over a million lines of code? Now, the Windows operating system, this is from uh, Information is Beautiful, the Windows operating system was about 10 million lines of code. A modern vehicle is about 100 million lines of code. So if we have a defect rate per thousand, and we're over 100 million, just do a little simple math. This is going to get hacked. Right? It's not just the software that's new. Everyone's had software and vehicles for a very, very long time. What's new is the number and range of remote attack surfaces. So if it's the tire pressure sensors, those are local. If it's the keyless entry, those are local. And with much respect and love to Bosch here in Germany, the CAN bus was never designed for security. So any compromise of any part of this network has unfettered access to the entire rest of the network. And now that most car companies are touting that they have a 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot standard in all vehicles, that means any psych psychopath on the internet can hurt anybody else if they're sufficiently motivated. And that's essentially what Chris and Charlie did. They went over the Sprint cellular network. They found a car that they specifically wanted with their ID. They manipulated that one car. They easily could have bricked and disabled all the cars that in the reach of the network. So it's not just that we're, all, we're adding all sorts of new attack surfaces like third-party app stores. So if you can get a bad third-party app into Google Play or Apple iTunes, you can get a bad app into a car in the same memory space that can control the brakes, the steering, kill the vehicle, et cetera. So typically, once you get them to acknowledge, yes, there's flaws, and yes, people can hurt you, they usually say, but no one would hurt you, right? They, they're trusting on every single human being on Earth being nice. And they're also forgetting about Murphy. So whenever I talk about threat modeling, I said, even if you think you have no adversaries, you still have to factor for Murphy's law. So we call it accidents and adversaries. So you have Murphy, you have ideological attackers, you have script kiddies, you have hobbyists who accidentally could hurt people. In the case of that hospital, no one was trying to shut down hospitals. They were trying to get ransomware. It just happened to also shut down the hospital. So of all those different adversaries, I don't think they're all going to be after you. But I don't want to be in a world where I hope they wouldn't hurt me. I want to know they couldn't hurt me. And that's why we say you must be this tall to ride the Internet of Things. So what we published were formal names and, not, and the casual names. But the five things I said is, essentially, tell your customers how you avoid failure. Tell researchers you'll take help avoiding failure without suing them. Tell us how you capture, study, and learn from failure. Tell us how you can have a prompt and agile response to failure, and tell us how you'll contain and isolate failure. And there's a whole lot of material behind these. 
But do you have safety by design? Do you have third-party collaboration? Do you have evidence capture? Do you have security updates? And do you have segmentation and isolation? So let's just put a little face on each of those. Microsoft is the best in the world at publishing their software development lifecycle. They call it SDLA, or SDL for Agile. And they're constantly improving this, and they have different things you do at different stages of that lifecycle. I'm not saying they write perfect code at all. Despite having the best SDL in the world, they still fix about 12 or more critical and high security defects per month. And by the way, they have about 10 million lines of code, not 100 million lines of code. So if one of the best in the world is still has to fix about 10 or 12 or just a couple dozen of these per month, guess what? The car companies are going to have to do that too. Number two, third-party collaboration. If you don't say anything, researchers assume it's a beware of dog sign. They're going to sue you. In fact, people like Dave Litchfield used to get cease and desist letters from the legal teams at these big companies, threatening them with criminal uh, prosecution through the FBI, threatening them against lawsuits for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, for the Digital Money and Copyright Act, for breaking the terms and conditions in the EULA. It was a very adversarial relationship. Conversely, if you have a published vulnerability coordination, uh, excuse me, a published coordinated vulnerability disclosure program, then you're basically putting on a welcome mat, saying, we care about our customer safety, we will, take, we will work with researchers acting in good faith, and we will not sue you if you bring us issues. So we've been advocating strongly for this, and there's two companies so far that have one. Tesla was the first one to do it. They actually went from a, uh, we won't sue you, to six months later they added a $1,000 cash prize, to six months after that they added a $10,000 cash prize. GM, General Motors, is now the second company in the world to offer a program, and all they're saying is we won't sue you. So they just started in January. Evidence capture. I got really sick of hearing from the auto industry that there is no evidence of hacking in automobiles because I pointed out there is no evidence capture to ever prove otherwise. It was the most circular thing I had ever seen. So just like the transportation industry for trains and airplanes, they use the black box, which is actually orange, which is an event flight recorder, not to spy on the cabin. So we said, let's do this in a privacy neutral way. Um, but we want something that's court admissible evidence capture to know if the vehicle's been tampered with, if they've been hacking attempts. Uh, how many and where, so that we can get smarter as an industry and focus our future designs on evidence instead of uh, blind faith or blind fear. Security updates, and this one's controversial, especially in the industrial areas. Um, can you securely update in a prompt and agile manner? Ideally, over the air. We do this every single day on our phones. It's constantly updating so that we have new features, bug fixes, and security holes plugged. Uh, same thing on our PCs and our laptops. But for some reason, in the areas that can affect public safety and human life, believe you should never patch these devices. So it's okay to be vulnerable to heart bleed or shell shock and be hacked, but it's not okay to positively shield yourself against those hacks. So there's a really big culture change, and we've been encouraging over-the-air secure updates. We don't know how to secure web browsers. We have figured out how to securely deliver uh, content and updates through so secure transport layers and cryptographic signing, and everything like that. So even though, yes, it adds a small attack surface, it's worth it, especially when you compare it to all the attack surface we're adding that is all risk. And then segmentation and isolation, um, what are the logical and physical segmentation steps you take to separate critical systems like the brakes and steering from non-critical systems like the radio? In fact, the video that you saw earlier today of Chris and Charlie hacking the Jeep, if all they did was hack the stereo and put their ugly picture on the dashboard, who cares? What they, we care about is because that information and entertainment device was on the same CAN bus and had unfettered access to the brakes and the steering and everything else. That's why we care. It's not the fact that they'll be hacked. It's how much damage can you do once you've compromised one of those components. So a metaphor I use is submarine. You know, you, you can and will have flooding in certain compartments, but you don't sink the whole ship. So we have to introduce better segmentation and isolation in our designs. If you have to send telemetry from your industrial Internet of Things, have a one-way diode where the controls network of the device can send telemetry somewhere, which can be harvested, but that there's no remote command and control. There's ways to design these things in the context of a threat model that could be 
many of the benefits, if not all the benefits you want without the unnecessary elective attack surface and complexity. So an example of the five star in action was here in Germany, you had the BMW hacked last February. And we, we used it as an example, we did a write up about why this exemplifies parts of the five star. It was a third party research group here in Germany that brought them the issue. They didn't sue them, they worked with them. Number two, because they had over the air update capabilities, they fixed it on 100% of their customers' vehicles before a single adversary knew it was vulnerable. So the ability to have an over the air update was very prompt and very agile. And in the process of updating it, a different researcher pointed out they were sending their updates over the air in the clear without any secure communication layer, and therefore it could be man in the middle. So they actually changed their update process to be more secure from end to end. And they didn't have to share that with industry, but because they shared their story, they helped other car makers get better. So did they have all five of the five star? No. Are they, do they have a published coordinated vulnerability disclosure program saying they won't see researchers? No. But this was an example of the benefits of having these five capacities for failure built in. And if you think about Microsoft, it took them about 15 years to go from suing people and sending cease and desist letters to giving a six-figure cash prize at the Blue Hat Prize. And I've been invited to speak at that conference. It's a very prestigious thing for researchers to get invited to Microsoft to the Blue Hat Conference. And they were willing to pay lots and lots of money to find bugs earlier and to find ways to avoid bugs and system design improvements. So if it took 15 years for them to get from suing people to rewarding people, if that mean time to enlightenment took that long, I hope it doesn't take us 15 years for the auto industry and the medical device industry. And that's why the cavalry is pushing so hard to compress that maybe to one or three years. But it's gonna take your help. There's also huge issues with the, the, the previous deployed fleet that cannot really be fixed. So a lot of them get very stuck on what do we do about all the exposure we have? We can't do anything differently. We already have those suppliers. There's only so much we can do, and it's very expensive to go fix it. So we try to encourage them to focus less on past failure and more on future success, or at least to have different strategies for their future fleet, their current fleet, and their past fleet. Because when this moment happens, will your response time be measured in hours or days, or will it be measured in weeks or months? In the case of the Jeep hack, they could not patch it over the air. They sent a USB key to every single customer of theirs that was affected. And to date, the last time I checked, only about 30% of the vehicles have actually applied the patch. So contrast that with BMW, who had 100% of their vehicles within 24 hours, versus something that couldn't be patched. And this is one of the reasons we stress the importance of this. And here in Europe, they're ahead of the US, for example, on the idea of autonomous vehicles and vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure. And if we want to have a secure system of vehicles talking to each other and to the roadside equipment, that's predicated on individual cars being trustworthy and not falsifying or spoofing signals to each other. So there's a lot more work to do if we could even get the five star in place. And from what I'm hearing, even the ambitious automakers think it's gonna take past 2020 to do just those five basic things. So as you think of and conceive of the next Internet of Things project you're gonna work on, we think those five things are very transferable to all different types of IoT. Okay. So that's part of what we showed to uh, Detroit, and I work closely with uh, Open Garages, which is a free platform for hacking tools, and you can start an Open Garages chapter in your uh, part of the world. So what about something very specific to developers? <sighs> Who's heard this quote before from Mark Andreessen? Is there anybody who hasn't heard that software is eating the world? Okay. What he meant is every company, regardless of what you do, is becoming a software company. And one of the reasons the industrial Internet of Things scares me so much is because there are all these hardware engineers who don't understand software, let alone cybersecurity. So when I see software is eating the world, I see it like this. And this is just one of the many attack maps. I see software is infecting the world. It's spreading like a virus. The number of devices that have Bluetooth and connectivity and Wi-Fi are staggering. So if I know that every single thousand lines of code has a flaw in it that could be the thing that gets you or your family hurt, yeah, I knew that any single failure could be that crisis of confidence which introduces more surveillance, more government response, more police state, which causes more defection and activism and ideological splintering. I look at this as a very concerning thing. 
Now, clearly, it's not all bad. If it was like the plague, we wouldn't adopt it. But we haven't tipped to understand when is there too much risk to outset the, uh, out, um, weigh the reward. Everything's a cost-benefit equation. And I would assert that to date, we haven't done the trade-offs. And I still need a better example than this, but I was fixing my patio, my deck outside my house. I had to buy new nails. And I had to buy galvanized nails. Does anybody know why we galvanize metal? It prevents rust. But what I didn't know until I screwed up is that I bent most of my nails because when you do that to the metal, you make it brittle. So when you need rust proofing, it's worth the loss of strength. And when you need strength, you might have to tolerate something else. I think if you fast forward into the future, we're only going to put software and connectivity into devices where the consequences of failure are acceptable. But right now, we're putting it everywhere. So I, I think it's not all good. It's not all bad. Uh, we have to find something in between. So for you as developers, everybody knows about Hartley because it had a logo, right? But the OpenSSL program is one of the most important projects that we all depend upon. It's not the only SSL implementation, but it's one of the most important ones. And just like the blood in the water before, even though one flaw, in fact, since you're developers, I'll tell you this very quickly. If you look at the commit blog for when this bug was introduced, it was like at 4 in the morning on New Year's Day. So to me, the story that never got told is that friends should never let friends drink and code. <laughs> I'm assuming there was some drinking involved. But while that one flaw was there, and it wasn't there for very long, they found it pretty quickly, what didn't get as much story, because there weren't logos for it, is there were 31 other vulnerabilities found in the same code base in the same calendar year. When a little blood is in the water, sharks circle. When adversaries realized, oh, wait, open source isn't somehow magic. It's not like more secure than closed source. I thought the many eyeballs thing said that all bugs are shallow, and we're going to find them all. But it just isn't true, because while there are many eyeballs, they're not incentivized, qualified, or motivated to go find them. And now there's millions of dollars being put into people looking for security defects in OpenSSL, and they're finding them. In fact, some have given up on OpenSSL, and instead they're moving to boring SSL, LibreSSL, S2N. They're alternative SSL projects that are much, much smaller, because they've determined that the code complexity is so large that there really is no cost-effective way to make it more trustworthy. Now, Reasonable people can disagree on that, but we haven't really thought about the quality and the risk of the open source that we depend upon. Okay, so things like Heartbleed and Bashbug and Shellshock have been confirmed in medical devices. They have been confirmed in the Internet of Things in your home. They're confirmed even in automobiles and certainly in industrial control systems. Um, what's different about IoT, and I'm gonna stress that star number four again, is 50% of the affected systems from Heartbleed, 50% could not be patched at all. So if you want to have one star for the Internet of Things, if you add connectivity, you must be patchable. Because it's easy enough to you know, roll your keys for your website or your social media platform. But if you have to throw away your router or your refrigerator or your toaster or your car, <laughs> if there's no way to fix it, that's a really, really bad thing. Shellshock did the same thing, Apache Commons Collections. In fact, that hospital outage that I referred to earlier, um, that was through a known vulnerability in JBoss. And if you remember the Apache Commons Collections issue about uh, it was the serializer, deserializer, passing untrusted input to the invoker transformer in Java classes, that was one library that did it. There were 2,200 libraries that no one's gone to look at that also do the same combination of bad behavior. So this JBoss vulnerability that allowed the ransomware to shut down the hospitals is also one of those uh, serializer, deserializer issues. So I really racked my brain on what can be done from the development community to make this less happen, uh, happen less often. And I thought about the Haitian earthquake. Do you guys remember the, the earthquakes in Haiti that killed 270,000 people, if I recall? 230,000 people. So it got massive humanitarian relief. Bono went there, all the former presidents and world leaders went there, and lots of money rolled in to help the, the tragedy of the Haitian earthquakes. It was a 7.0 Richter scale earthquake. What got very, very little coverage is just six or so weeks later in Chile, there was a much stronger earthquake, 8.8 .8 Richter scale, and that's logarithmic for the math people. It's a much more significant earthquake. But it only killed 279 people. 
And of all the factors they tried to study and isolate, the, the most determined factor was building codes. Chile had building codes, Haiti didn't. So what shook buildings in Chile flattened buildings in Haiti. So it wasn't the presence of earthquakes. It wasn't even the magnitude of earthquakes. It was sufficient building materials and building codes. So if you think about that, look at the ceiling, everybody, real quick. Um, we're in a building made out of steel and concrete, and none of you sat here in mortal terror that this building was going to crush you and collapse upon you. And that's because we have come to a point where we can depend upon architectural skills and building standards and the right kinds of concrete and steel, and we know how to do this. But what we don't have is building codes for building code. And I don't know what that would even look like, but several years back I wrote the Rugged Software Manifesto in, re in response to the Agile Manifesto to basically be like a Hippocratic Oath for software developers. And one of the lines in there that uh, the security people like is that I recognize my code would be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security. The, the developers like the line above it. I, I recognize my code will be used in ways I cannot anticipate, in ways it was not designed and for longer than ever intended. So I don't know what the answers are, but I know it's going to fall to you. In fact, there were um, bridges, physical bridges that collapsed in Canada, and it was so devastating to the public that they couldn't trust driving over bridges that the engineers made a ring out of the metal of a fallen bridge so that every time they typed on a keyboard, every time they hit their ring on a table, they would be reminded of the awesome responsibility that comes with building bridges. And I think the same is about to happen to this community. Developers with hands on keyboards are writing digital infrastructure, and we are becoming as dependent on that digital infrastructure as we are on buildings and bridges. But is it, are we up for the challenge? Now, it's because of the conversations I had. There's a sister organization to I Am The Cavalry that I wanted to point out. They're much more focused on small Indiegogo Kickstarter-sized projects that are on Raspberry Pis or Arduinos or on the electric imp platform. It's called builditsecure.ly or build it securely. And what they're basically doing is two major things. They're writing reference architectures for hardening these various platforms that you may choose from. So if you don't know which one platform you want, they'll probably give advice on the best, most defensible, robust platform for you to start with. And if you already have made a choice, they'll give you guidance on how to best harden and secure that particular platform. But what they also do is as long as you give them prototypes or devices, parts of this movement will do threat assessments and security testing for you uh, to give you a professional look at those things. And they're really aimed at the smaller devices. Uh, we're really aimed at the devices that can cause that crisis of confidence or public safety issue. But they're an excellent resource. And then one thing I decided to add, I've got significant materials on this, but just to tease it for you, um, the, the number one question we get from a lot of these manufacturers who are used to traditional security is, how is security different in IoT? And the framework, which also has a lot of stuff underneath, but just to give you something to at least consider when you go back to work, is basically I say we have different adversaries, we have different consequences of failure, we have different context and environment for the operating environments, we have different composition of the hardware, firmware, software stack, we have different economics and price points and price sensibilities, especially on those really, really small devices. And we have different time scales, especially on those really, really large devices. You know, the, the industry would like our cell phones to be replaced every two to four years. But an industrial control system is meant to last for 30 or 35, 40, 50 years. So if we get it wrong and we can't patch these things for these larger things, the time scales, we may not be able to patch it in 30 days. We might not be able to replace it for 30 years. So the time scales are different. So if we're going to have more um, ideological adversaries, the consequences of failure will be market confidence or life and limb. The context and environment for an insulin pump is it will not have a perimeter. It's a nomadic and migratory device. It's going to have to be its own perimeter. And any assumption you have about other devices in the home that might protect it are going to be bad, bad assumptions. And we use different you know, hardware, firmware, software stacks than we're traditionally used to for a PC. The number of security things I can stick on top of that laptop is very high. The number of security things I can stick on top of an insulin pump is nearing zero. And in fact, I hope we don't do that. No offense to one of the other speakers, but I don't want antivirus in my car or on my insulin pump. 
But if, you, if that makes sense to you, then what you can start to ask in your threat modeling is do not assume that there's no money in hacking the device you're working on. Um, ask about the accidents and the adversaries. Um, and in fact, for free, the cavalry helps do some of that wargaming, even with, with your engineering teams or even with your executive teams. We've even met with the board of directors for some of these large industrial internet companies. So back to the tale of two quakes. It's up to us. We can't stop the fact that there are hackers and sharks and apex predators. We can't assume we won't fail. What we can do is use the best building materials, and we can structure things in such a way where we isolate and contain those failures. Um, and I think I might have enough time to show you this thing. Yeah, I'm going to try. Well, this will be the fastest time I've ever done. This is very specific to developers. So up until a month ago, I was the CTO for Sonotype, and if you don't know the name of the company, you might know the products, but it's the uh, custodian of the largest open source repository in the world called Maven Central. It's where all the Java binaries are. So I got to see a global purview of who's consuming which projects and which vulnerable versions of which projects and how quickly, if ever, do they take the fixes. So I looked at it like a, like a biological uh, study of the hygiene of the global supply chain of software. And what I saw is that the hygiene is really, really terrible. So let me just show you a data visualization of this. I think I can do this very quickly. So if 90% or more of a modern application is third-party and open-source libraries that you didn't write, we're not really writing code anymore. We're assembling it. So which parts that we choose and how high quality they are and if we are tracking them well is one way that you could specifically can help improve your um, how safe and secure the world is. So back to that software is eating the world. Whoops. So if software is eating the world, then I'm going to show you a single piece of software and what it really looks like on the inside. So here is a piece of software, big green circle. But we don't write software anymore. We assemble it. Usually people guess that they use 50 unique parts, whether it's OpenSSL, Log4j, Apache Commons collections. People usually pick about 50 projects in the average application. The truth is, though, that you end up with about 106 on average because the pieces that you choose choose other pieces. There's transitive dependencies. So you get a lot of code you don't want and those bloat the number of lines of code, and we know there's a defect rate per 1,000 lines of code. So while I'm not even doing this typically as a security talk, I'm doing it as an efficiency DevOps talk through this rugged DevOps movement about supply chain principles applied to modern software development, there is a ratio of those that, that go bad, because like we know about software, it ages like milk, not like wine. So software goes bad. So t as a ratio, 23% have a known vulnerability in them, um, one or more. So they might be low or medium or high, but any one of those could cause that fatality moment. But to developers, any one of those can trigger unplanned, unscheduled work. And then you're not on time, you're not on budget, no one wants to do rework. So I, I really articulate these as triggers of unplanned work. There's also bad licenses, so if you use like a GPL or a copy left, you might have to stop what you're doing and replace it with a different licensed component. So those are the purple things. So if a single application has that many landmines in it, these are the poor building codes and building materials that you might have seen in Chile, excuse me, in Haiti versus Chile. And they're entirely avoidable. If you had looked at the expiration date on that version of Bouncy Castle, a crypto library, um, there's a remote code execution flaw in Bouncy Castle from 2007. It's been fixed since 2007. And despite the fix being available, thousands and thousands of organizations are still taking the vulnerable version. They cost the same, they work the same, they have the same APIs. You're choosing an elective attack surface, an elective risk that might be rework, but might also be life and limb. So this is an area where, since the Internet of Things is mostly open source, you could choose better projects and better versions of those projects. And you know what, I'm gonna skip the rest of it so we have some time for questions. The challenge, though, is on a single application, if only 10% of those in a given year cause you to do rework, it's about 30 hours of waste and maybe 3,000 US. But since you're not touching one app, you're touching 10, your team is touching 100, a modern company has over 1,000, even at 100, 
you're now talking about a quarter million dollars just in rework. Forget the risk and the attack surface and fines and breaches, just rework. So what I'm trying to encourage is that rugged DevOps is that the profitable thing and the efficient thing happens to also be the safer thing. And that's something that developers could look at as well. Don't just use whatever project you're used to. Use the highest quality, highest hygiene, most secure versions of those libraries. And with that, I'm just going to show the last slide and then take questions if there's time. All systems fail. <laughs> OK. So again, we're in this, uh, this sea of the Internet of Things. It's too late, right? And unlike the ocean where I could find dry land, if we're not careful, we're quickly running out of dry land in the Internet of Things. So uh, it's my belief that knowing you have a problem is the first step towards solving it. And I'm sure we're going to figure this out eventually. So the goal of talking about this and the goal of trying to get you to participate in the I am the Cavalry group is not to avoid these failures. They will happen. The goal is to be safer sooner. And the only way we can do that is if we do it together. So with that, um, I thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you realize the awesome responsibility that comes with what you're doing. And uh, the Internet of Things can be as wonderful as we saw yesterday. It could be as perilous as we discussed today. The key ingredient to which of those two worlds, if we're going to be Haiti or we're going to be Chile, is really the choices that this room makes. I thank you for your time.